Our first uh, keynote this morning is by Attila Lazar, who is a research fellow at the University of Southampton, and his title is as you uh, see up here, Attila. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, during the last two days, we have heard many interesting uh, presentations about complex system modeling and uh, complex issues. Well, uh, today I would like you to introduce to another kind of complex system modeling, um, which is going to be quite different from the previous presentations in many aspects. One aspect is that we are working with multidisciplinary uh, research teams and try to integrate the results together and also uh, that this project is ongoing currently so we are just halfway through so I can't provide you final results I can only give you the, the, the vision the tools that we are using and what is going to be the, the output why we are doing all this hustle around this project so um, that's the outline of my presentation so I'm very briefly talking about the project and the integration aims showing some results, talking a little bit about uh, uncertainty uh, within the integrative tool and uh, model testing and just wrap up very quickly. So um, this is a four year long project financed by the UK, A UK Aid, the UK Environmental Research Council and uh, Economic and Social uh, Research Council. Um, the aim is to provide uh, the knowledge and tools to the Bangladeshi decision makers to make more informed decisions. So this is a study is in the present. Um, we're trying to look into the near future, so next 50 years, and try to do some policy scenarios within the work. We have a large consortium to do this ambitious job. We have 20 some partners from three different countries. And on, on a regular Bangladeshi consortium meeting, we have 60, 70 participants normally. So it's a large group to work with. Um, so as I said, we are um, located in coastal Bangladesh, the tidal influence part of the Ganges, Brahmaputra, Magma, uh, Magna River, uh, river um, data plane. And um, as a result, uh, we, we have a focus on the, the coastal zone, but to be able to tell anything useful about the coastal zone, we have to really consider what is outside of the study area. So we are considering exogenous drivers where the Bangladeshi decision makers have no uh, influence on or at least very little influence on like up, upstream flow diversion in China and in India or climate change, macro, some macroeconomic changes. We also consider um, the upstream river basin to provide boundary conditions to the study area. So we are doing detailed hydrological and sediment transport modeling. Also colleagues working on the Bay of Bengal modeling, what's going on with the tidal ranges, sea level rise, uh, fishery productivity. Um, when we zoom, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention the endogenous governance, which is the national scale of the project. Uh, that's where the Bangladeshi decision makers can make a difference too. So what policies they uh, create, uh, how um, subsidies are formulated, what they support, um, what is the flood protection initiatives, infrastructure development, all, so these aspects are considered to some extent in this project. Uh, and when we zoom down to the local scale, uh, to the study area, really uh, we are interested in morphodynamic changes, land use, land cover changes, and also the changes of the productivity of the system. So uh, the relationship of the environment, how, how that changes over time and space. Uh, but we don't stop at the biophysical environment. We are really would like to couple what is happening in the environment together with what is happening in the social system. Um, how demographical changes are likely to take place, what are going to be the likely market changes, and how security and livelihood and well-being are changing at the rural population at household level. Um, this slide is really just to point out two things, that governance is uh, um, in um, working together with every project element, 
And from day one, we have a stakeholder engagement with national level decision makers. Um, they are working together on uh, creating issues, what they are interested in, uh, developing scenarios that we are tested with the models. And when this integrative tool is developed, then we are going to have an iterative learning loop together with the stakeholders. We try to learn together about the system, how it works. So just very briefly about the project elements, because uh, just to show you how multidisciplinary this project is, uh, the, the first pillar of the project is governance research. Our lawyers from Dundee University assessing the laws and policies in Bangladesh, what are the gaps, implementation efficiencies, conflicts in between legislations. Also working together with the stakeholders um, all, all during the entire project period. And then the second pillar is the social science, how I call it, demographics, um, household economics bit. We collect primary data at household level qualitatively and quantitatively about how they live. We also uh, create population projections and create a statistical associative model that I will introduce a bit more detail later. And all these feed into a dynamic and quantitative understanding of what is happening on, on ground uh, in terms of people and households. And the third pillar is the biophysical modeling, practically the, the, the environ, uh, entire system, uh, starting from climate models, projections, hydrological sediment transport models, modeling the Bay of Bengal, um, modeling the data plane with FVCOM and L3D. Um, those feed into the morphodynamic analysis and the land cover model. And all these together affect the, uh, the productivity models that we are applying in this project. But we don't stop here, obviously. We would like to integrate these knowledge together. So it is a very ambitious aim to bring these disciplines to, together, working at different scales, different time, time scales, spatial scales, and create something useful, uh, useful information for, for national level decision makers. So uh, I just would like to highlight that we have a special focus. We have a, a hypothesis within this project that rural population in Bangladesh is highly depending on the ecosystem services, so the, the quality of the environment, they actively modify it, and the quality is affecting their livelihood. So that's our hypothesis that we would like to test with this integrative tool and predict uh, what is going to be the impact of any change in the system. The change can be governance decision or climate change or environmental change or uh, a change in the, in the behavior of the, of the people. Um, as I said, it's a large ambitious project. We have multiple uh, working groups working on different elements of the, of the system. Uh, and they are working together, so they pass information to each other, mostly as a unilateral flow of information. But we would what we would like to, cre to create with this integrative model is a more rapid assessment tool that encapsulates all this research that is uh, going on within this project and create a dynamic framework which, uh, which allows a, a forward-stepping feedback in the system and which allows a more rapid um, and more numerous testing of different scenarios. Um, yeah, so this, this work is um, mainly building on the, the in-depth research of our, of our colleagues and trying to, to encapsulate and make, make the calculation faster. So how we do this? We, we are going to use simple uh, process-based models, if they are simple enough to include in this uh, integrative framework. If they are too complicated, like the dev 3 d model results, then we are aiming to reduce the complexity to Bayesian emulators. So just capture if the inputs change, how the output is going to change, and um, that is going to be uh, used in the, um, in, the, in the integrative tool. Just keep in mind, we are trying to give, say, say something about the coastal changes. So some of these models uh, in the integrative tool, we, not, we don't need the detail of why is happening in that, um, uh, uh, what causes the change. We just need to know in the integrative tool if something change happens, how the output of that model is changing. Um, so uh, let me just briefly introduce this data, the uh, model framework, which stands for um, Delta Dynamic Integrative Emulator Model. 
It's it designed to be a holistic tool encapsulating both the biophysical environment, social behavior, livelihoods, and some uh, governance issues. It's a meta model which practically just harmonizes the run of the different model elements together in an efficient way and har harmonized way. And um, the model elements are going to work at different spatial te and temporal scale and have different complexities. Some of them just statistical relationships, some of them probabilistic emulators, and some of them, uh, especially for the household level decision um, model, is uh, probably going to be an agent-based type model. So um, actually, this Delta DM model is going to have two versions. One is what I call a hybrid version. When we estimate the environmental changes with process-based models, some demographical changes, considered governance actions, and try to estimate how land use, land cover would change. And using a statistical associative model, directly estimate livelihood and poverty changes. So this is based on, um, I will talk about this later. And then the second approach is a more process-based version when we don't stop here, but we uh, apply uh, productivity models which feed into a household level livelihood model and that will give us indication of our deep well-being of the coastal uh, population. Hopefully, these two approaches will support each other, but if not, again, we, we can learn something from, uh, from the differences. So we'll, we will see in, in a year's time what is happening. So this um, hybrid model, as I said, is using this statistical associative relationship. And uh, this statistical model is trained act actually based on land use, land cover information shown here, uh, environmental quality information like soil salinization, and poverty information, which is uh, coming from the census data that is available for three years um, over the last 30 years. And this is a map uh, created based on the census data. The red means that it is high poverty. Green means that it is relatively better off. It doesn't mean that they are rich, just better off, not necessarily at hardcore poverty. So what our colleagues do in Southampton actually applying a, a number of statistical techniques to create relationships in between those two, uh, actually those three. Uh, we also consider actually, I, I forgot to put it on, the infrastructure uh, and network, road networks. So uh, here are two examples. The first one is really self-explanatory. Uh, so, which is uh, the facts, the, um, assess the, uh, the relationship between irrigated land and poverty. It is not surprising that it is, there is a linear relationship. The more you irrigate, the higher your crop productivity, and therefore you are getting better off. The second is a bit more thought provoking. Uh, if you have high land of mangrove area around you, or if you live in cities, you are, tend to be poorer. If you are in between, you tend to be better off again. Uh, we don't know why. This is just a pure statistical relationship in between different input and output variables. But uh, these are just two examples. There are other on salinity and other aspects that we would like to combine in a statistical model that will be applied in this data DM framework. The more process-based model is simplified here. So we will have, again, the hydrology sediment transport models. We will emulate the coastal inundation and, so and salinization um, that will feed into a land use land cover model together with the demographical changes. We run productivity models, household level assumptions, and we will estimate human well-being. Uh, this is a simplified version. This is a bit more in depth what is going to go in, in this model. Uh, but there's not much time for that. So rather, I will show you uh, some ex expected output, what kind of information we are going to get out when the model is fully operational. So first is, this, first is the demographical changes. We will be able to track in space and time how people move in between uh, districts, how population changes in terms of sex and age group, distribution of the population. So this calculation is actually done at district level. We have nine districts, but the results are going to be downscaled to union level, which is the smallest planning unit in Bangladesh, having an average surface area of about 26 square kilometers. And we have 655 unions within our study area. You will see some maps about that in a minute, like here. So these are the unions 
and the output of the model is going to be at union level. We not necessarily present the results to stakeholders at this level, but the calculations are done uh, monthly and uh, at union level in the more process-based approach. So what you can see here, actually, is the crop changes of crop productivity under just one scenario. If there is no irrigation and the soil salinization increases con uh, continuously over time, then you can see how the staple foods would change, uh, the productivity of the staple food would change in space and time. Uh, we have about 36 different crops in our crop library, so we can do complicated cropping patterns with this model. Um, but as I said, everything is preliminary. It, uh, the, 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 um, it has to be updated when the, the researchers, colleagues, have updated, uh, finalized their results. Um, we can do household level uh, indicators and indication what is going on with the people. So for example, we can do profit margin a calculation that what is the fraction of the revenue that remains in your pocket when all the cost is paid. Um, you can see that preliminary result shows a quite distinct difference in between uh, regions of coastal Bangladesh. Um, we can check this at agent types. So these are my, my farmer agents, large landowners, small landowners, or shack operators, and landless laborers. Each of them have different characteristics and behavior, how they operate. Um, what you have to, to know here is one doesn't mean that they are rich. That means that they are OK. They don't have too much cost in, in relation to their income. When they close to zero, that means that they are, they are in big trouble. So they need either loans. So loan schemes are going to be important in this research. And, um, or they have to do multiple jobs to survive. Uh, and finally, some likely uh, indicators that we are planning to include in this integrated framework output. Um, these are just some of the indicators when, uh, on which my social scientist colleagues are working on. And these are the ones I have selected that are likely to be included in this framework as an output. So for example, income expenditure ratio, we are going to have a routine to estimate the likely di diet of a household based on wealth and background. Uh, and also based on we can estimate the calorie and protein intake and food insecurity and hunger periods over time because we are considering seasonal changes in the system. Um, but there are also other uh, indicators that we are thinking of. Some of them are just an empirical relationship developed based on primary data that we collect on the field. So uncertainty. Well, as you can see, it's a complex model. It's, it causes me a big headache how we are going to do this formal uncertainty analysis of the model. But I have a simple plan so far uh, that we are doing uh, formal uncertainty analysis on each of the process-based models, creating these tornado charts if they are not exist already. And we are going to have an automated built-in Monte Carlo sequence in the, in the integrative framework. So when the integrative model run once, Actually, this crop model, crop productivity model, is going to be run 16 times, varying those most important parameters and estimating the uncertainty around the mean output of the model. Uh, when we have a more complicated model, like DEV3D, as I said, we will uh, simplify it to an emulator. And uh, when we create the emulator, we keep track of the error around the mean uh, output of that emulator. And again, that mean uh, and the mean value, the, the error and the mean value is passed on in the model chain. And we are counting all the uncertainties all along the model chain. So when you have in, um, um, stakeholder um, agent types, you, you always have an envelope of, of um, response, an, an, an envelope of livelihood. Uh, indicators. Uh, validation is another key issue. Uh, we have known for a long time that we never be able to validate environmental models. And um, Nomi Yoreshkesh, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this paper. It's a theoretical uh, um, paper, but it's, it's, it's worth reading if, if you are not aware of it. Um, she, argue, she argues that in life sciences, you will never be able to fully test and fully validate and fully verify your models. And this is certainly true for, for our case, which is not just pure um, biophysical processes governed by physics, but we also have people inside in. So, uh, but still, we have to do some, some uh, kind of um, validation and testing of this model. 
So the first and most obvious step is checking the code and then checking each model element separately. So productivity tools like the agriculture crop productivity tool, checking it against published land suitability maps, published uh, farmer's yield data in statistical yearbooks, and check if your, if your results are resembles the, the observed pattern. If this is done, uh, for all the elements, we are moving on to the entire model, testing it in a full extent, and checking more global variables like land cover changes, poverty levels, inundation, uh, or, um, as a result of, of a historical flood event. So these testings are on the historical period. And the final step that we would like to do is really compare the hybrid and the process-based results, because the hybrid, is 100%, uh, the hybrid uh, statistical model is 100% representative for the study area. The census data is 100% representative. If they support each other, that's good. If not, we are trying to, to learn what, what makes the difference. And these results actually are discussed with the stakeholders. So we, every time we produce a result, we take back to the stakeholders for discussion. And uh, in the policy cycle, we will allow them to test ideas how they would tackle with some of the results that we have in the modeling. So we try to learn together with the stakeholders how the system works. But why do we do this? Um, so this last slide that I was planning to show you, um, just give an indication what are the, key, the questions that we would like to answer and assess with this integrative tool and with all the in-depth research that what the colleagues are, are doing in, in, our, in our project. And to remind you, with this integrative tool, we are not aiming for 100% accurate two, two, um, three precision uh, results. We are aiming just to, to give trends, likelihoods, and robustness of, of uh, different changes and different uh, governance decisions on the different elements of the system. So these are, these are just some of the questions that, that we had in mind when we started the project. What will be the extent of inland flooding on a hypothetical uh, event, storm surge or river flooding? Um, where will be the isoline for threshold salinity lie for different crops in the future if we assume different scenarios? what will happen and different management interventions like more polders, um, less uh, flow diversion or more flow diversion in India and so forth and so forth. How productivity would change over time and space under different scenarios and how poverty levels would change in relation to productivity changes and environmental changes. Um, what is going to be the effect of um, further, uh, more significant flow diversions and reduce uh, sediment transport? Also, what does, what does drive migration and where would, we, would you expect higher levels of migration in the study area? What would subsidies and remittances, whether do, do they make any difference to the, to the poorest of the poor in coastal Bangladesh? And whether global commodity prices like diesel, rice, shrimp, do, does, do they have an effect uh, on, on the, the, the lives and the environmental change in coastal Bangladesh? So these are just some of the questions. We have actually a four page long document just listing different questions and grouping them into sections, whether they are depending on just one um, um, discipline, so output of one research group, or whether it requires a full integrative model to, to answer those, those questions. And finally, just, just a, a summary that we are aiming for a holistic uh, generic tool which the methodology uh, can be applied elsewhere. Obviously, the details have to be updated. Um, we are aiming to link the environmental change with livelihood change of the rural population in coastal Bangladesh. Uh, the in-depth research is still ongoing, so um, both the biophysical models are still being calibrated and tested. Uh, hopefully we will have the final outputs by, by summer this year. 
and the uh, quantitative social research is just started and having uh, the first results in the next month or so. So everything is ongoing and the integration is ongoing. So hopefully by the end of this, uh, this year, we will be able to start doing the simulations and, and running the full model. So the hybrid model actually is, is expected to be operational by November this year and the full process-based model early next year. And we are hoping to start the policy cycle March, April next year in 2015. So um, that was it, a brief overview and, and the vision of our project and the elements of the project, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. Thanks, Attila. I have a couple of questions. Um, first, you said that um, what my first question is about the uncertainty, and you are um, doing these uncertainty and sensitivity analyses. I wondered how you intend to communicate that to both the Bangladeshi government as well as the stakeholders, and if there's any sort of plan in place for um, how you might handle any pushback on the uncertainty that you produce in the models. And the second question is uh, about the stakeholders. And um, once you go into the field and present your model results to them with or without the uncertainty, will you use their feedback as inputs or will you modify boundary conditions based on the stakeholders' comments? Uh, yeah, difficult questions. So communicating uncertainty is always a difficult issue with stakeholders. But uh, we can't avoid. So your model result is as good as your input data and your assumptions. So how you can reduce it? Um, we, you can part partially reduce uncertainty if you work together developing your uh, assumptions based on the stakeholders. So we just had a stakeholder meeting three weeks ago in Bangladesh. Uh, where we had about 80 uh, participants from different ministries and, uh, and, and national level organizations and research institutes. And we are going through with all the assumptions that we make for business and usual in the future, and we try to implement those assumptions like flow diversion rates or changing in, in diet habits of the people or um, uh, uh, every aspect. We have actually 104 items on the issues that the uh, Bangladeshi national level uh, people identified uh, that they are interested in. Uh, we can't model all of them. Uh, we try to include as much as we can in the model framework and using their knowledge on those issues we are setting up the model. So that's, that's how we work. So, but yeah, we have to communicate uncertainty because otherwise it's, uh, it can be misleading. The question is similar to the other one, but uh, I'm interested in the, uh, the level of uh, information particularly on, uh, that you're uh, gaining and monitoring, and particularly on local climate, and I note that the kind of precision that you're talking about for your interests is, overlaps very much with mesoscale models as opposed to global models, and one of the, uh, and getting information back and forth to the, to the locals is very helpful for locals, but also hugely helpful for those of us who are interested in, in understanding the climate and being able to get information back to them. So I'm curious what your method is of, of communicating data in that case. Communicating data to? Uh, actually, uh, monitoring, uh, uh, long-term monitoring of, of any of the components that you have, but also, uh, but particularly of climate variables. Well, uh, in terms of climate variables, we, we have a, a difficult situation because we were not able to get any climate data from Bangladesh. But we, uh, we have a partner, the UK Met Office, and they provide us uh, um, um, climate projections for both the historical period and for the, um, for the future to 2100, actually. So it's much longer than what we need. Um, and. Um, and we are using these actually to drive the models. So these are downscaled uh, regional model outputs of, of climate models. So we have uh, selected three ensemble members of a 17 ensemble uh, and uh, um, 
tailored to our needs. So those are the which reflect changes and, and would highlight uncertainties. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Uh, we um, can talk about it later, but it has to do with, uh, uh, with monitoring, uh, local monitoring of information, particularly uh, taking advantage of cell phones and other ways of, of uh, transferring information, different scales. Um, as I said, we, we don't use local monitoring data. We have a, um, a grid cell about 50 square kilometer for, and we have uh, climate data at, at those cells. So that's what we use.